How's it going? And welcome to my guide on the introduction and a chapter one of the fifth edition module, Tomb of Annihilation. The introduction is going to cover your player's motivations as to going to the peninsula of Cholt, finding this so-called soulmonger, and putting an end to this blighted death curse. Chapter 1 is going to cover the last bastion of civilization left on the peninsula, Por Nanzaru, a place thriving in gold, secrets, and splendor. Before I go into anything major though, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. This is for DM's eyes. Players, if you plan on playing on this adventure, kindly and politely uh, look away. Send your DMs this way though, because I am going to go ahead and cover some uh, really awesome stuff that uh, may be overlooked. Alright, now the player's gone, let's go ahead and dive right in. The introduction for this campaign basically gives you a insight onto what's going on. Aserak the Lich uh, has found a dead baby god in Atropol and is now housing it in a tomb he created a long time ago, the Tomb of the Nine Gods. This tomb is located in a city named Omu, which has been lost to time. Uh, very few people know about it, and uh, even more so, the place is incredibly deadly. The dead baby god uh, is still an infant and needs to be fed. So Aserak created the soulmonger, basically this artifact, which is collecting the souls of everyone on the material plane. It is collecting the souls of, you know, the people that currently die, and it is ripping the souls out of the people who have already died and been brought back to life. A uh, really great hook as to how to get your players to this place is by saying, you know, all the high-level adventurers in the world are, are dying. All these emperors and kings who have been brought back to life are dying. Really, really scary stuff. And uh, because of this terrible thing, Basically, low-level noobs have to be sent all the way to Chult and save the day. However, uh, no one knows where exactly this Soulmonger is. They don't know that it's an Omu. Uh, through some type of experiments and some you know, backroom information, uh, Sindra Sylvain, the player's patrons for this adventure, are, is privy to the knowledge that the Soulmonger is located somewhere in Chult. It doesn't actually say how she knows this. What I would go ahead and tell your players if they inquire is through a very, you know, not uh, nice ritual, maybe a ritual involving uh, ritual sacrifice, you're, they, they are able to discover that the souls are being ripped to a specific location. And through enough experimentation, they are able to find that the souls are being pulled to Chult. However... Once they get too close to Chult, this ritual becomes uh, no longer useful, and uh, the, at best that they know is that the uh, whatever, whatever is pulling these souls into you know this object, it is definitely located in a Chult somewhere. So with that being said, your players meet with Sindra Sylvain, and she tells them, "Hey, you know, there's a world to save. We gotta go, and I'll go ahead and teleport you right there." She hands the players this map. And this map is awesome. It is a very intricately detailed map. Uh, however, something to note is uh, this map is incredibly detailed, incredibly useful, and people want this map. If for some reason your players start flashing this map around, they can find themselves in a bit of trouble because there are certain people in Por Nanzaru who uh, will do almost anything it takes to get this map. So if you feel like having uh, some you know fun hooks in regards of you know your players getting ambushed or you know making backroom deals with some of the uh, NPCs, then go ahead and don't tell them about the whole oh hey this map is lucrative. But if you want your players to have that you know sense of urgency and secrecy, then Sindra Sylvain should totally say hey you know don't show this map to anyone. Uh, wink wink. Uh, really awesome stuff here, you know, looking at this map. This is a great way to show your players the scope of this campaign. Let them know, hey, you know, this map is your play area, and this play area is more than enough. You do not need to add any more to this adventure because there is plenty. So your players armed with this map are dropped 
uh, unceremoniously in poor Nanzuru. So let's go ahead and take a look at him. They find themselves in a city far, far away and surrounded by people they probably don't know unless uh, they build characters from here, I guess. Uh, that brings me to a good point. I would probably recommend not allowing players to be from Port Nanzaru because a, a big portion of this campaign is that adventure. It is the, you know, discovering this brand new stuff. And taking that away by saying, oh, I know everything that there is to know kind of detracts from the, uh, you know, the, the history of this world and by, you know, letting one player automatically know it. Uh, but with that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and dump right into chapter one here. And chapter one has a lot of fun stuff. So there's a cool little stuff about the arrival and uh, all the things that they get to see, the dinosaurs that are walking around this place, the tabaxi minstrels that are singing their songs, the peddlers settling this honeymead called Tej, all this great stuff. And that is the beauty of this campaign. Your players are dropped here, and that's that. They can do whatever they want. This game is not linear in the sense of they go to this room and then they do this. This entire campaign is written as in they are expected to go anywhere and do anything. Which can be a little hard for some newer DMs. I know I was a newer DM the first time I started it. But I have since grown into it, as I assume all of you will as well. The campaign, you know, shows off a whole bunch of locations of the city, gives some awesome detail to really make this place come to life, and shows off a whole bunch of NPCs. But what I'm going to be talking about here is some of the motifs of this campaign and how you can get this thing started. One of the cruxes of this campaign is it is a very uh, time-consuming campaign. Your players moving across the jungles of Cholt is going to take a tremendous amount of time. Each hex takes 10, each hex being a 10 miles, takes a whole day to travel. And as we just saw on that map, there's a lot of hexes to travel. Um, what that means is they're going to need a lot of food and water and insect repellent and this and that and yada yada yada, this and that. They need a lot of stuff. So money is a really big deal in this campaign. It's sort of emulating that old school approach of you need to hire, you know, people and you need to bring the resources and all that stuff. That is where this campaign diversifies, though. Do you want to run this campaign as a old school hex crawler? Or do you want to run this campaign as, you know, uh, as 5th edition is sort of designed as a pulpy kind of action adventure uh, setting? If you do want to run it as a old school hex crawler, then I would definitely lean in toward the money aspect of you need money for guides, you need money for food, you need you know you need a whole bunch of porters to carry your stuff, you need you need a whole like traveling uh, carnival of people that are going to be carrying all the stuff for you as you go through the jungles of Schult. However, if you definitely want to lean into that new school approach, then kind of hand wave it, give them a bit more gold at the start. And only, you know, have them bring one, two, or three NPCs along them with their journeys into the jungles of Cholt. It really comes down to your personal play style and what your players want. Uh, but this campaign is so modular, you can do whichever one you desire. I can't recommend anything, of course, because uh, I've run it multiple different ways. And it just comes down to your player's preference. Uh, next up, we're going to go ahead and look at uh, some awesome side quests here. Uh, the book gives us 10 side quests, all of which either have something to do with inside of the city or deal with uh, going into the jungles and meeting more NPCs. Uh, these are fantastic. These let you interact with more of the factions that are all around uh, Chult and Pornan Zaru, uh, such as the Order of the Gauntlet, the Flaming Fist, the Merchant Princes, and uh, even the Zentarum. So really, really great way to get your players in. In fact, actually, one of them is involved with the um, the Red Wizards, which uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment about all the different factions that are going around this campaign. So really, really awesome stuff. 
Next up, we're going to go ahead and just a, a quick look at the city denizens. We have some merchant princes, which, by the way, they sell some pretty awesome stuff. They sell exotic uh, weapons and armors, uh, such as magical items. Pretty awesome stuff. Well, you can buy Triceratops for only 500 gold. Who wouldn't want a Triceratops for only 500 gold? Uh, you can hire a guide, which is going to help you travel through the jungles of Chult. If your group really doesn't have anybody that's uh, good at, uh, at traveling and all that. Insect repellent, because uh, as per written, this game uh, is definitely hardcore and makes you roll a whole bunch of saves and stuff. Totally hand waveable, of course, if you don't want to deal with diseases and nasty stuff. We have, um, you can buy magical scrolls and potions, uh, really useful stuff for people that uh, have a lower magic group. And, uh, you know, more uh, just the, the jewelry. Who doesn't want to buy jewelry? Uh, all of those merchant princes listed right there, they have their own flair to them. They have huge amounts of information on how to roleplay them, and if they're good, and if they're evil, and if they're antagonists to the party, which... Most of them are antagonists to the party, as per written, uh, but can certainly make great allies if the players are willing to help them out with that. There is a lot of things to do in this city. They can buy some items, they can enjoy dinosaur racing, which, by the way, dinosaur racing is fantastic. It's a great way to uh, bet some hard-earned money, and also important, there is mechanics on how to run the dino racing. And that's just really, really awesome to give your players the sense of, oh, they can just simply bet on the dino races and you can just tell them who won and who, who gets money. Or they could say, hey, I want to go ahead and dino race in either their player character or, you know, an NPC that they take over races and, you know, roll some dice and have some fun at the table. Really, really awesome stuff. Uh, finding a guide is actually listed as a tremendously big deal here because... As written, it's almost required to have a guide. The guides, you know, are, are good at survival, and they might know a thing or two. And the guides are just so well written. They are fantastic. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right into the guides. If I can find it. Here we go. So uh, let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go ahead and dive right into all the guides that are listed in, in the book. We have Azaka Stormfang. Uh, she is charging five gold a day, which, as a friendly reminder, one hex equals one day, and you know that's going to add up real quick. You're only out there for 20 days. You know, do the math. That's uh, that's a lot of gold. Uh, Azaka is, says that she's willing to guide the players, but if they were to um, were to do a little quest for her, they might she might be able to waive the fee. However, that quest is dangerous, as that takes them to a uh, place called Firefinger, which is guarded by Terrafolk. And uh, the potential of getting thrown off a 300-foot uh, sheer, you know, fall is pretty scary. But it might be worth uh, it because a lot of people are stingy and don't want to pay up all that gold. And this is where the writing for this book is fantastic. Uh, this, all these guides all have their own motivations and desires and also secrets which could potentially be damning to the party. Uh, Azaka's, of course, is the fact that she is a were-tiger and she's also afraid of heights. You, some could call her a scaredy cat. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, terrible. Uh, so, you know, having that, you know, influence of, oh, she wants to guide players to the Firefinger, but she herself doesn't want to go up the Firefinger, you know, that could be pretty scary. Uh, but also, she, she happens to know a thing or two about the jungles. Next up, we have a Eku. Eku is a guide who really only wants to work with good aligned people. Uh, her kicker is that she is actually a Kuwadl, and she cannot tell a lie. So as a DM, you have to be creative in not saying anything that would give away her uh, Kuwadl-ness, while at the same time, uh, you know, not not telling a lie unless you want to bend you know what she is but that really you know presents a fun role play challenge not only for the players but for yourself as well uh, next up we have feral and gondolo 
And these two guys are absolute, you know, losers. They they blew all their dad's money trying to win it all big. And they are now in Chult. And they're basically trying to dupe adventurers into giving them a whole bunch of money for nothing. But the thing about them is that they actually did stumble across something that could potentially be good. They do have a treasure map, which does lead them to a uh, dead dragon's lair, which does... Uh, bold, you know, does have some loot. So even though they are kind of nincompoops and they actually don't have good stat blocks at all, uh, they have the stat blocks of, uh, I believe, scouts at best. They're not that great. Uh, next up, we have uh, Hugh Hackenstone. This rough and tumble dwarf. He looks scarred up. He's missing an arm. He, you know, he's loud and boisterous. And he claims that he got this from a dragon and, uh, you know, he made, you know, he, he's, he's doing fine. But his kicker is that if the players hire him, he's going to basically uh, tell them, oh, yeah, we're totally going this way or wherever, but secretly guiding them to his mine so that the adventurers can uh, inadvertently face the dragon so he can reclaim his mine. So a potentially damning and uh, very disheartening adventure awaits with Hugh Hagenstone. Musha Reeb is an albino dwarf and actually sits in almost the same boat as Hugh Hagenstone. His mine is taken over, but not by a red dragon, but by red salamanders. Uh, basically humanoid uh, salamander folk that are totally evil and spit red fire and stuff. Uh, he is more forthcoming about his mine being taken over and is totally willing to uh, to uh, parlay with the party if if uh, they join in on his conquest of his own mine. Uh, next up, we have River Mist and Flask of Wine. These two tabaxi kind of skirt the laws. They are willing to uh, charge a lot less, only four gold a day. Uh, almost all the other ones have five gold a day. So only four gold a day seems pretty uh, dope, and no no payment up front. But they are skirting the laws, and they are working with the seedier people of the city. They're working with the Zentarum, and could potentially backstab the party if the party is not aligned with the Zentarum or other forces. And last up, we have Salida. Salida, the most damning of all the adventurers. Uh, her her like little handout is great. She's just saying all the other hand you know, all the other guides are just terrible, and she herself is awesome. But the thing about her is that she is a yuan -ti. And she's not a, you know, just a nice and kind of polite yuan -ti. She is a yuan -ti who is going to actively send the adventurers into the jungles deep enough and get them captured so that they can become slaves. So, really, really awesome stuff here. Just the fact that all these guides have, you know, all these motivations and all this, like, detailed stuff is fantastic. What I'm going to tell you, though, is... If you're going to have your players go out into the jungles and return, you seriously need to either paint a picture that there is more guides that are currently always being lent out, or you do need to add your own guides into the roster. Because if your players go out into the jungles, come back, and it's the same, you know, several guides always available, it is going to seem a little hokey and like, oh, you know, what are the chances that it's always these people? So definitely, definitely consider, uh, you know, painting the picture that the guides are always taken or add your own. I would recommend, though, if you add your own, you put in as much detail and motivation into those NPCs as possible. Give them something that makes them look good. Give them something secret that makes them bad underneath. Really, really uh, make the characters, the, the guides shine. I... You know, uh, now we're going to go ahead and dive right into um, some of the other stuff about Chapter 1 and the introduction here. Your players can certainly, you know, just hop right in and start storming into the jungles and not really care about Chapter 1. Or they can spend a tremendous amount of time here. Uh, you are the DM of your group, and so you're probably going to know better if they are the kind of group that wants to go out into the jungle, come back and share their rewards... Or if they just want to go out into the jungle one time and that's it. And they just explore the jungles until they find Omu. It really comes down to 
uh, how you kind of present this world and how you want the adventure to go. Chapter one certainly has a lot to offer here. If you're willing to uh, stretch it, you can have tons and tons of sessions here. But quite frankly, if your group just wants to go out into the jungles and hack and slash and get to the main quest, then don't have them spending time here. Have them meet up with uh, such you know, NPCs as Grandfather Zatembe, who happens to know that he sees a vision of death and destruction all the way down south of... Um, south of uh Mbala and then he'll he'll basically say oh you know i i saw a vision of snakes and a lost city and all that stuff have them meet up with a merchant prince who says hey i happen to you know be privy to some information i'll fund an expedition if you want your players to get out of the jungles then send them out into the jungles don't play this game of oh you have to do this you have to do that this is not one of those books. This book is fantastic because it really lets you shine as a DM and really plan this adventure for your players. That being said, though, my personal taste and takes on Port Nanzaru is a lot of my groups love coming back to this place. They love seeing the progression of the world. They love spending their hard-earned loot. They love meeting new NPCs and old NPCs. And it's a really good idea to flesh out this world. So, uh, I added a whole bunch of guides, I had um, a lot of the merchant princes interact with them in some way, most notably Wakonga Otomu, which is very convenient because Wakonga Otomu is friends with uh, Sindra Sylvain. Definitely a great way to uh, get your players involved with the political machinations of Port Nanzaru. And most important of all, is something that comes up in all my campaigns and is barely touched on in the book is the arena. One of the highlights of Port Nanzaru is this massive domed location that we're looking at right now here, uh, this, this place. It's an arena, and while it says you can place bets on the arena, like there's only like a little paragraph about the arena, it, there is actually no rules on fighting in the arena. If your players love, you know, earning some gold and doing so by getting into a fight, definitely write up some rules about the arena have them say hey you know the registration fee is 25 gold for the team and then they can earn you know 50 gold for a win and you know just have throw throw a whole bunch of like you know uh equivalent party you know sizes at them it's a really great way to get your players invested and also meeting with one of the other merchant princes akina fa who is the merchant prince of the arena essentially really flesh this place out uh, so many NPCs to go over, so many guides to go over, but really it just comes down to thumbing through and seeing what really works for you. I can only recommend that you throw a lot at them and see what sticks and use what they pick up. Uh, as you can tell here, there is uh, a lot of like locations uh, located outside of the city as well. The old city, Malar's Throw, and Tyriac Anchorage. Uh, you know... Play those up as well. Play them up as, oh, they are, you know, the, the city is the the middle upper class and the outside cities are like the lower classes. Uh, definitely play that up. And totally, as you can tell here on the map, there's a dragon turtle. Uh, we'll be getting to that in chapter two. Um, yeah, really, uh, really not much more I can say other than definitely, definitely make the place shine. And if you want this to be a return visit, if you love Port Nanzaru and your players love Port Nanzaru, uh, have the place feel alive and make it feel like it's continuously con uh, you know, living with or without them. But have those NPCs ready to go, have those guides fleshed out, and have them really integrated with the party. Uh, as you can tell here, chap uh, Chapter 1 is just all about Port Nanzaru, while Chapter 2 is going to be all about the jungles. And uh, that also plays into how they interact w going about into Chult. Realistically, there's three ways that your players will go into Chult. They either start walking, they go down one of the rivers in a canoe, or they take a ship uh, and go down the outskirts and make landfall somewhere. All this is covered. They can simply walk out. They can simply uh, hire a canoe, uh, or buy a canoe, or they can hire uh, the... Uh, the, the ship captain, Captain Ordemay, Swift and Dark, uh, piloting the Brazen Pegasus. 
And that is a great way to travel because the Brazen Pegasus moves 10 miles in an hour. So they can definitely make a lot of uh, headway. Uh, they'll far outpace how far they could have gone uh, in the ship in a couple of days than if they had walked. Whew, lots of talking. All right, so um, next up, uh, let, let, for, to finish this off, let's go ahead and take a look at the factions here that are moving around the, uh, the, the campaign area. There's a little bit about the Emerald Enclave, and they are trying to preserve nature. The Emerald Enclave are full of hippies and wilderness survivalists. Uh, they don't really have too much of a presence in this campaign, other than that a uh, few guides do operate with the Emerald Enclave, and uh, they are openly associated with the Flaming Fist. The Flaming Fist, however, are probably the biggest faction that your players will be interacting with. For your players to go into the jungles itself, they need, um, or they're, they're supposedly required to buy a, um, a, a writ of adventure, essentially, which costs 50 gold. And what it really says is it costs 50 gold to buy it. And whenever you return to Port Nanzaru, you have to turn over 50% of whatever you earned in the jungle to the Flaming Fist. The Flaming Fist are a great antagonist uh, peoples. They can totally be seen as conquerors and, you know, just, you know, these elitist people that are coming here and staking their flag into the ground and saying it's theirs. And they definitely make for uh, awesome villains because no one likes turning over the loot and no one likes these people that are just, you know, claiming territory. Uh, the Flaming Fist, of course, being a group that is out of Baldur's Gate and that they still have workings with Baldur's Gate. Uh, we'll get to this in Chapter 2, but uh, the commander of the Flaming Fist in Cholt, uh, Lyra Porter, she is totally evil and she's totally working with pirates uh, that are operating out of Jahaka Bay. And uh, there, there's some fun ties in there. Harpers, the Harpers don't have much of a presence in this campaign other than Artis Simber is a former member of the Harpers and Artis Simber is a man that is running around Chult right now. Um, once again, more on him on Chapter 2. Lord's Alliance. Uh, Lord's Alliance is, uh, you know, th these, these factions have minor roles, but the... Uh, Lord's Alliance actually has a pretty awesome quest in Port Nanzaru. If your players map out two simple locations, Nangalore and Oralonga, for the Lord's Alliance, they will be provided a ship. Really, really awesome reward for theoretically not too much work. Uh, Order of the Gauntlet. The Order of the Gauntlet does have a semi-major uh, component in this campaign because they operate Camp Vengeance here. They originally uh, had Camp Righteous, but Camp Righteous was overrun by the undead, and Camp Vengeance now is their mainstay. The Red Wizards of Thay. These guys are a huge potential thorn in your player's sides, as they are totally evil, and they want the Soulmonger. Uh, but the thing is, they don't want to destroy the Soulmonger, they want to study it, they want to use it. So if your players express their intention of wanting to destroy the Soulmonger and, you know, save the world and all that, the Red Wizards are probably going to be very antagonistic toward them. Their leader is Valindra Shadowmantle, a lich who is currently staying at the heart of Ubtau, and she is sending her subordinates to Omu. Lastly here, uh, or second to last here, we have the Yatepka Society. The Yatepka Society gets a lot of uh, verbiage here. They, they get a lot of paragraphs about what they do. They are essentially a group of good people in poor Nanzaru that try and keep the peace. And if anybody ever tries to act out of the society's norms, the Yatepka Society essentially threatens them by placing an iron token on their doorstep or whatever. And, uh, you know, tells them, hey, you know, stop doing that bad thing. It, there isn't actually any, you know, uh, quest or anything involving the Yatepka Society. It simply states that they are a group that is trying to do good. Uh, their only written members are Zindar, who is the harbor master of Port Nanzaru, and I believe one more. But uh, definitely a, a thing to use if you really, really love that deep political uh, aspect of Port Nanzaru. And last but certainly not least, the Zentarum. 
the Zentarum being that shady organization that loves to get in the way of everything and is looking for Artist Simber. Why are they looking for Artist Simber? Because he's got a badass artifact, the Ring of Winter. Uh, Artist Simber, uh, multiple people are looking for him. There's Quest involved looking for him. Uh, there are uh, multiple factions looking for him. Heck, there's even giants wandering around the jungle. More on that in Chapter 2, though. There's giants wandering around the jungle that are looking for Artist Simber. So, that guy is wanted by everybody. Uh, really, not really too much more I can say. Uh, oh, by the way, there is not one but two maps pertaining to Port 9 Zyro. There is the Port 9 Zyro map, and there is the uh, Merchant Prince's map. But hopefully you shouldn't have to use a battle map, because hopefully your players don't get into any combat with the Merchant Princes. Uh, but really not much more I can say other than... Uh, let this module be its own, be your own. Like, the, I've run this three different times now, and every single time I've ran it, it's been a little bit different, but more importantly, the players have had such a major impact on what goes down that each each run is different. Um, I can only, you know, help out so much saying, hey, definitely flesh out this, definitely do that. But Chapter 1 is such a, you know novelty of what it is there's not really too much more i can say that i haven't already said definitely make this place come to life if you want it or don't tell it to you Whew, once again lots of talking here all right i think that's gonna wrap it up for chapter one here um really fantastic stuff really really sets the mood for the campaign of uh, you know, a place to go to to stock up and then head out into those dangerous, nasty uh, jungles. There is... Man, I need water. Uh, yeah, chapter one, uh, fantastic stuff, but once again, not needed if you if you just want that hack and slash. So play, So ask your players what they want and see what they want and play with it. That's going to wrap it up for this, uh, this one here. Chapter 2, though, I am definitely going to be going in-depth. Chapter 2, I'm going to be going into every single named location and talking about it and giving my insights on how to run it. Uh, I, I'm i not going to do that for this for Chapter 1 because there's way too much stuff. But Chapter 2, definitely all those combat encounters and all these uh, possible role-play encounters, definitely going into that. So if you're really interested in that, go ahead and stick around and see all of that. That is going to wrap it up for this one here. If you have had some awesome encounters in Port 9 Zyro, go ahead and tell me about it. Or if you have any awesome encounters planned for Port 9 Zyro, go ahead and tell me. I want to know because I certainly have added a lot of uh, flavor to Port 9 Zyro. I've had a lot of great combat encounters here. I've had a lot of just fun roleplay encounters. My best memory of Port 9 Zyro was when my players had a... Or the, one of the player characters had a wedding here and the wedding was interrupted by Zentarum. It was, you know, it was just a great, great uh, cap into the campaign, which uh, right after that started to descend into the uh, epic conclusion of the campaign. So go ahead and tell me all, all about that. And I want to hear it and I'll definitely share more of my stories. That's going to wrap it for this, uh, this, this chapter, but uh, chapter two, definitely lots of detail to go. Thank you all for watching and goodbye.